Hey, welcome everyone to the Archicad User Monthly Webinar for June 2023. My name is Eric Fabro, and it's my special guest. Uh, I have a special guest today, Stefan Boykins and Ruben van der Waal, uh, Belgian architects, who are the authors of a new book called A BIM Professional's Guide to Learning Archicad. Welcome, Stefan and Ruben. Yes, thanks Hi, for having us. Yes, thank you. Well, late at night uh, where you are, at least, uh, what, 10 o'clock at night. Um, so thanks for staying up and being available at this time. Um, let's make sure everybody can hear us and see the screen. Um, so if you uh, uh, can type into the questions area, um, just something saying hello and uh, maybe where you're calling in from, as well as, uh, well, just uh, a greeting. All right, I see Mario from Rio de Janeiro and Rich Matthews from down in Australia, Ian from Scotland. All right, so we first three people, three different continents. Stephen from Langley, BC. Excellent. So uh, that's good. Um, and uh, yeah, Carl from California and uh, Roman from Munich, Germany. So not too far away from you, I guess. Uh, yes. Yeah. Reinhardt from Boston. All right, so we've got a good group um, right now, 40 attendees, and I'm sure it'll go up to you know, 50, 60, maybe 100 people. Uh, so thanks for joining us today. So uh, yeah, last year I got an email from um, a publisher saying that uh, there was a new book, um, training manual book for Archicad that was in the works. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how it all went down, but at, at one point they asked, uh, would you be interested or can you help us uh, sort of be a mentor or a guide or review the book in progress, give feedback? And I said, yes. But then I was so busy that when they sent some chapters of the book, I just didn't respond and then eventually said, you know what, I'm, um, I'm just not gonna be able to do it. And a year later, I get a notice saying, the book is out, here's a copy, please enjoy it and if you'd like you can make a review um, of it and I thought you know what uh, this is a significant event in the world of Archicad you know there aren't really training manuals and guides that come out every year you know this is uh, an unusual thing so I wanted to get to know you Stefan and Ruben um, a little bit and share the news with the larger community so uh, tell us a little bit about your background and the origin of this book. Okay, yes. Well, um, just as a very brief introduction, so my name is Stefan Boykins, or Stefan Boykins, it's usually in English. Um, I'm a Belgian architect engineer, um, and I used to work for a while as a professional architect, as a licensed architect in Belgium, a variety of projects with a few offices but actually returned uh, to the university. So I've done quite some academic career after that, uh, working on a PhD, specifically on building information modeling. And uh, after a few years, after the finishing the PhD, I had the opportunity to return to the construction practice, but now in the role of a BIM consultant. So rather than working as an architect and working on projects, we focus on information management uh, and software development at D-Studio, the company I'm, I'm working on right now, and which I'm also a partner in. Uh, so we're still very much working with BIM, uh, using variety for a variety of projects and clients, but um, not anymore in the role of an architect. Mm -hmm. That's it. Um, I got the opportunity as, as, as a long time Archicad user to, I was I got an invitation from the publisher. They, they always look for expert users to write something. And I was I was pleased to be, to be, be asked, but at the same time, a bit worried to, to see that I could cover everything or have sufficient um, hands-on practice. And I knew Ruben. Ruben was very active in, in teaching RGCAT in Belgium. He also have, well, he will explain his, his background. But I thought it would be a, a very nice opportunity to do this as a duo. Uh, and I'm really pleased that I asked him because that's, that's really a complimentary effort. So by the way, here, here is the book. 
have been professionals, Guy Tark, CAD. So it's available on Amazon, uh, maybe other places too, but um, uh, I've shared with those of everybody's on my list, you know, you have the link here. You know, if you look for a BIM Professionals Guide to Learning Archicad, they also have it available in um, a Kindle format. Um, and I think uh, I got a PDF. I'm not sure if you're making that available, but uh, I thought, you know, this is something that would be good to flip through. Uh, I'm sure you'll show us a few things inside the book as we go. Uh, so, Ruben, tell me how you got involved in the project. Um, did uh, Stefan call you? Um, know each other for a long yeah. time yeah i think we know each other for like 10 years uh, stefan in person uh, yep, I, something I knew like stefan, that, yeah. uh, a little bit uh, longer before as a as a reference for bin in belgium i think he's doing a great job in standardization as well but i got to know him through a uh, postgraduate program at a uh, university where we uh, started out uh, teaching architecture get together so it was a, a cooperation the first time uh, making an archicad model uh, my career is a bit similar to that of Stefan, so I'm also an uh, engineer and architect. I was a licensed architect up until last year, uh, but I evolved into uh, consultancy on, on BIM and Archicad uh, specifically. The uh, difference being that I have been working for the local reseller uh, for one year, so Cubis, who develops the, the Dutch and Belgian template for Graphsoft Archicad, uh, I've worked for them one year getting to know the inside of Archicad, and along the way I became a teacher at the University College in Rouge for Applied Architecture, where there's a large focus on BIM, and specifically Archicad as a tool is uh, mandatory. And so one day, uh, uh, Stefan called me, I was interested in uh, joining him, and I was very pleased that he asked me. Uh, for me, it was the first time in, in writing, he has a little bit more experience in that, and it has been a, a wonderful journey, uh, giving us the opportunity to, to like, uh, get a little bit of structure and, and all the things we have learned ourselves and we have been teaching to other people as well. Right. So, so it's like, a, yeah. Yeah, so uh, when I asked, you know, uh, recently to you about uh, the book, I said, is, is this intended for new users uh, exclusively? Um, you know, what, what, who would benefit from this book? And I guess your response, both of you were um, that, it is intended for the newer users to get up to speed, to really learn ARCHICAD well, but you have incorporated many tips and tricks, things that veteran users will appreciate. And so um, I think uh, I, I asked you today uh, to do a little demonstrations, uh, show a little, uh, show a few things uh, from your work uh, on projects, um, as well as some excerpts from the book, at least bring it up <clears throat> on screen so we can see the structure. Um, now, I'm going to uh, just ask, you know, we have uh, now, uh, I guess, about 50 people on the line. Uh, we aren't going to have a lot of time for open questions, but if you'd like to put in a question, if you'd like to say, you know what, I'm, I've been puzzled about how to, the best way to clean up roofs and walls and how they intersect or some other thing, do put it in there, uh, webinar, and I will at least pass these questions as we go. Uh, so if you have a question that you'd like, you know, to get both my opinion as well as Stefan and Ruben's input on, uh, do put that in. Um, so uh, I'll make, which one of you would be ready to share your screen right now? Maybe if Ruben, do you want to start? Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so I've got a few things to prepare. So, uh, I'll make you presenter, and you'll then yes. be able to um, share your screen. You may have to choose which screen it is, um, and then we'll we'll be able to see it. Yes, okay, we we're seeing the this curtain wall. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I prepared uh, a few things as you asked um, before, uh, Eric. Uh, so maybe first uh, um, I look into the book on how it's structured. Um, so it is actually. That build up as an introduction into Archicad, so meant for new users um, using an example project that they can model uh, step by step. But at the meantime, we try to give an insight into the software. Uh, we have a long experience in teaching Archicad and also are considered, I think, uh, quite veteran users uh, of Archicad in our uh, region. 
of the world. So we try to combine the two. So it's also useful for uh, users who have been. Uh, well, your audio is a little bit, um, I don't know, indistinct. So if you can lean forward and maybe speak yeah. a little slower. Yeah, I'll try. I'll do my best. Uh, so I've put my mic uh, a little bit uh, closer to me and I'll try to talk slow. Uh, um, so, for instance, uh, maybe try to start with this one. So on, on visualization of uh, models, that's one of the aspects covered in the book. It's covering how you can render uh, in ARCHICAD itself, but we also found it is interesting to show some possibilities or options uh, with 2D images in ARCHICAD. So it's not uh, a Photoshop uh, program, of course, but you can go uh, a long way or quite far with using attributes, span sets, textures, and so on. So this is uh, an example I use in my classes at the university. And we apply this to our model. So this is a, an image um, of the model that we use in the book. So it's a quite basic uh, residential uh, uh, project, a small house. And in this chapter, uh, we uh, show the readers how they can visualize it with rendering, but also how they can use uh, a combination of techniques. This is the last chapter, actually. So a combination of techniques they have learned throughout the book to set up a, a more nuanced uh, image. And maybe I can show how we do this in uh, ARCHICAD or how we uh, tackle an issue like that. I think most of the, the people who are watching are uh, yeah, well-trained ARCHICAD users and know how to make a layout and put a view on this layout. But this is an image that we have fully developed in ARCHICAD. So how is this done? Uh, it's not just one elevation view. It's based on an elevation view. It's, of course, derived from a model, but it's a composition of multiple views that we uh, put one on top of the other. And this is shown in the diagram uh, in the book, as you can see here. I hope this is uh, readable for everyone. So we have a backdrop, a picture. It can be an image of the sky or surroundings, a picture you took yourself or a stock photo you take from the internet. And then we combine several images we take from a model. Uh, the most important one being this, I suppose. So the elevation view is coming directly from the 3D model. In the back, we can have uh, a fill to uh, gray out the sky a little bit, and then we can put uh, trees in front and maybe a tree before the building. So if you watch this model, if we take the, a look at the basic elevation, just let me check. It's a south elevation. So if we open this um, default elevation, and we should see a building, of course. I have to turn on my layers. It should give us a, a default image of how uh, a typical elevation in ARCHICAD looks, depending on how you set up your template. Interesting that it's taking a while. I guess your computer has a bunch of things. Uh, yeah, because I'm sharing my screen and um, I'm having some ARCHICAD sessions running in the background. So I hope it doesn't hang and I don't lose my connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're almost there. Once we see that the polygons are calculated, we're close to the finish. There it is. So I think this is a typical view in ARCHICAD. So you have the, the complicated 3D representation of uh, the three objects, the car, the shade that is developed by the, the sun. And then I've added some textures. So that's a setting in your, in your uh, elevation that you can choose if you want black and white or you want to see uh, a solid color or you want to see a, a hatch or a texture. So we, we choose textures, but we yeah. only use the textures of the walls. Before you go on, Ruben, can you open up the uh, elevation settings dialog for this? Sure. Yeah. Because it was only in the last couple of versions that ARCHICAD could do a rendered elevation with textures. And that, just show where that control is. It was added into yes. either 25, I think 25 or maybe 26. And this is yeah. uncut elements, things that are not, not being cut through that you're seeing you know, in an elevation are being filled right now with um, a color fill non-shaded as opposed you should, I, I thought you'd have texture fill where where is the texture fill so uh, here's the texture fill it's lower but as you can see at the bottom it looks it looks like you've got um 
uh, you've got actually uh, the textured fill there. Is that not correct? Not completely. As you can see, I'm applying a graphic override because oh. then I can choose for specific materials to show as a, in a textured way. Uh, the limit of uh, using the elevation settings is that you have all elements in a textured visualization, and also trees and the columns and so on. So uh, developing a graphic image sometimes in competition, for instance, you want to tell a story, you want to have focus on certain materials, and then you want to be able to choose which materials show as a real material, and other stuff can be shown black and white or whatever. So just That's why we include this uh, graphic one, override. Yeah. So in that graphic override, take the one that says wood, um, the one below that. So the one below, the, the next one down, or next one down, or just open up the setting. So it's basically, um, you're saying, even though the elevation um, is set to just show shading as opposed to textures, in this, mm -hmm. when you with graphic override, you're saying anything that's a wall that's made with um, a name that says wood, so it's, you know, a wood, wood mm -hmm. siding there, just give it this color. So obviously you could be more specific about the composite name if you have more than one version of wood, but this is yes. a way of saying, you know what, just throw some wood on there. Very interesting yeah. um, thing. So uh, it also gives you the liberty of using uh, a fill in the overrides instead of the texture that is um, linked to your uh, material, which is not always of the best quality, but we can come back to that uh, later. Uh, there's a solution for brickwork from that. But for this specific exercise in the book, we combine uh, a few of the, of the things we've learned, and graphic overrides is one of them. Because you have more control in how you want to visualize um, certain things in your model. Okay, so that's interesting. So it's not being rendered uh, as an elevation, it's being overwritten with a graphic uh, yes. surface. Yes, right. So it's it's a little bit like we would export this image to Photoshop and then paste a, a graphic into the, the surface of the wall, but we just do it in Archicad using a graphic override. And we still have the shades on top of this uh, element and so on. Right. But as an image, this may be not that appealing. It's not that graphic. So we have these uh, textures, but we also have these complicated uh, trees taking a lot of time to be rendered. So that's why we leave out the trees in the final view. And we combine them with um, 2D trees. So we create a worksheet for that, uh, on which we just place uh, trees as an object in a 2D view. And we can then uh, set these trees with a transparent uh, fill, so 50% uh, uh, fill is used, using a foreground pen that is white in this example, and the background is uh, then transparent, which creates this uh, semi-transparent uh, layered structure of trees, giving you uh, a graphical way of presenting uh, like a, uh, the woods in the back of the house. The car is also treated in this image, so this is just a 2D worksheet sheet that we, of course, uh, have created by placing it in front of the of the elevation using the elevation as a uh, trace reference. And you just turn on the trace reference, and uh, so we can see. Um, yeah. So to coordinate this to make sure that the trees are in reasonable place, elevation-wise mm -hmm. as well, uh, there. The, um, right now you're turning on the trace to be able to see the elevation that is yes. associated with this worksheet. Um, yes, it will take some time again because I, I suppose it's the, it's the elevation I've just shown, so that can, uh, takes some time to render. You could of course question why are you doing this, so this is like uh, doubling your work. You have to coordinate these two views. It's one of the maybe uh, few um, problems we have with library elements uh, in Archicad, uh, especially the trees uh, and, and uh, shrubs and so, and so on, that the default objects are not always graphically represented uh, in a good way. Now you can see the backdrop, so I'm using these uh, 3D placed trees, as you could see in the, in the image in the book, as a backdrop that I can position my 2D uh, graphical representation of the trees. Right. Okay, so, so one of the ways you could speed up this process is to have a, a version of the view where the tree, the, the complex geometry trees with lots of leaves are turned off 
because that's probably what's slowing everything down is that it, you know you've got thousands yep. of leaves each one with some shape so uh, the number of polygons is higher than uh, usual yeah it's actually one of the the tips uh, i give my students every year that they try not to use trees nor bikes because they have too many polygons if they are designing a large project with a lot of trees their system hangs and it's because of the polygons not because of the size of the building most of the times so anyway if you do anyway, if you an alternate view without the trees and just of course use these graphics then you're going to um it's going to come up you know much much more quickly all right yeah much faster there are some solutions of course in the markets that uh combine this 2d representation with a 3d object and so on but it's not um available in the default library of graphy right okay uh, there are a couple when, of when questions have... here just yeah. before you go on that are quick questions. So is, uh, Ian Reid asks, is the book Archicad version specific? So is it specific to 26 or is it relevant to all recent versions? What would you say? Well, writing um, a book takes a long time. <laughs> so we started out uh, with tw uh, version 25, actually. And along the way, we... Uh, we uh, migrated to 26 so we uh, we took some uh, screenshots and we wrote some parts because some things changed but you can use it i, I think at least for those two versions maybe it should be fine for the upcoming version as well yeah. so it's uh, it's based on 26 but the techniques applied uh, should be usable in uh, 25 i think that well. the majority <laughs> might be applicable for one or two earlier versions yeah, I would I'm, say go as, as early as, as 20 or 21, that might be stretching it a bit, but I think the majority, many yeah. of these tools we have for, for several years already, of course. Yeah, yeah. My, my experience with the teaching stuff is that, uh, you know, most of the things, most of the principles apply over many, many versions. And <clears throat> there are some things that are new, like, you know, we, as of 22, we started having what the, the custom stairs, um, you know, the, the new stair tool and, you know, the when the curtain wall tool was enhanced. Um, but in general, uh, most of the things that we're talking about apply, uh, even going way back further. Um, and then the other <clears throat> uh, sort of facetious comment from Dan Wyckoff is, is the book heavy enough to hit Revit users over the head and knock some sense into them? You know, <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I think it's, you, maybe you should show it. <laughs> it's uh, 600 pages, so yeah, <laughs> I feel you have to order the physical book for that. Yeah. All right, yeah, uh, do go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt so many times, but yeah, this is good. no problem, no problem. Um, so as you can see, I have these two uh, views prepared, so I have this. Uh, barren elevation, so without the 3D elements that I have recreated and my 2D worksheet. And I have this worksheet with those elements, of course. And I'm combining them in, in my uh, layout. You see a little bit more stuff than just uh, the elevation and the trees. There's also one tree that was in front of the building. And of course, if you're placing uh, images one on top of the other, so I'll move it, I'll move it uh, a bit to the side so you can see the different images. You have to uh, pay attention to your drawing order. In ArchiCAD, we can choose how to stack uh, several elements, not only in your plan view, but also in your layouts. And many times it's forgotten that the layout actually is also something you can draw on or you can model on. So this tree is not an object. It's a, it's a copy pasted from my worksheet, so it becomes um, a, a line or a polyline and a fill. And I can place this tree in front of everything. So I get this layered structure uh, in a, in a two-dimensional image because I am combining uh, several uh, elements at once. Excellent. So I'll take it apart, so it probably will become a little bit more clear uh, for the viewers. Now you have the, the elevation view. Uh, over here we have the worksheet. That's a single tree, copy-pasted, and uh, the last one is just uh, an image and then yeah you can add this for new ones if you want if you leave it out it's also fine it's just playing with what we can do uh, giving a little bit more depth to your uh, image you could use a gradient fill uh, that is semi-transparent or in this case it's a column fill to make it a little less blue and a little bit more uh, appealing um, to the viewer 
Uh, you could so also that's in short term uh, how we can do this. You could have a gradated fill. So instead of being a solid yeah. color, you could make it go from light to dark or dark to light, or from yeah. one color to another uh, using the gradient fill. So yes, yes. So that's interesting. If you want to add a little bit more depth, it's like the fog of depth that you have in some rendering softwares. It creates a little bit of a fog at the bottom, for instance, or at, at the top, fading out the image uh, into the into the paper. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I could maybe show this if you choose. Uh, you go back uh, when you get a chance to the book and just the organization of the book. You know, sort of how do you conceptually how do you start the training process, uh, you know, what, what's different about this than just reading the manual, right? You know, because that's ultimately the question for any teacher is, um, you know, we don't want to just teach, click this button and, and do this. We want to teach concepts, so. Yes, uh, maybe Stefan, you can go into this question or? Yes, yes, well, there was obviously a consideration and both, we both have been teaching students to, to be to get introduced to Archicad, which, as we know, is is a very deep and vast software, especially after so so many decades of of adding features and features. Um, and I would say the manual is is a bit daunting, especially for students to because they don't know where to start looking. The, the, the manual is very complete. It's, it's it's not a book anymore because it would be too heavy. But the idea is that as as a student, you can only learn in smaller steps uh, especially if you're introduced in such a complex program so we try at least for the first part of the book to focus on a rather simple project but go through it in a logical order you, st you start from from a core layout uh, and i'm thinking Ruben is showing a few of the pictures so even just placing a few walls and getting getting up to to speed with how, how do you, you put it in the, the right size the right dimensions it's it's not just drawing something and, and hoping that it, it fits. No, you, it has to be on a precise distance. You have to understand how you make small modifications. Um, and there are some approaches you could go through tool by tool and go through all the, the settings at once, which personally I find a bit off-putting as, as a student because you're introduced to too many concepts. So we, we say we start with simple things and we don't have to explain everything in the first go. So we rather say we let's let's move from from zero to a small building, two stories, a few walls, having a roof, few uh, doors and windows, and based on that we prepare a small small drawing sheet, a small layout with a few drawings, and ensure that we get get something on an, in a PDF file or, or to be able to ready to print. Of course, you skip mm -hmm. a lot of the depth of what what you could show, but that that would have the risk of overwhelming students quite quite a mm -hmm. lot so i think the also... is indeed to to there are a few step by steps so the first time you, you need to enter something and you need to enter the dimension and to understand the tracker obviously you need to need some some hand holding in, in in the beginning because it, it might be overwhelming but gradually once we we said a few times okay this this is the way that you you pick up a parameter or that is the way to to enter a distance or a relative distance after two or three times, we assume the reader can learn. So gradually, with, with each step, they become a bit more acquainted with, with the software. Right. Now, I think, um, yeah. you mentioned your, you know, the building, the subject of a lot of the teaching uh, development. Is that something that you share, uh, like a link to download? Or do you have a PDF so that people can trace over it, or or is it just referenced in the book and you have to build it yourself? Ideally, you would build it step by step, but of course we we understand that not every step might might work perfectly, or you might have missed one or two particular settings. So what we did, and and that's that's a lot of the work that that, that Ruben has collected, is is to ensure that that for every chapter we have we have working version. So along the first few chapters, you would have, I think we, in total, we have about 12 or, or 13 different versions of the model, each evolved mm -hmm. up to a certain position. So even if you might, might miss a step or two, you can go look in the model. It's, it's freely downloadable and you can inspect it and maybe select a few objects and see where things might have happened. 
because okay. we and know this is one of the complexities if if you start from scratch that's that's one of the discussions we had what what, what template to use what settings to use and we understand RCAD is available in, in more than 20 different language versions and you might have even several additional variants uh, looking looking at different templates there are some uh, specialist templates I don't know, like the ones you provide or some of the other users and, and and they're all interesting but we have to start somewhere so early on we decided let's let's stick to the international version which is the most common one obviously it's not the perfect template for every user either there are many things to discuss but you have to start somewhere so you, do you provide a link to that uh, base template yes i think at the beginning of the chapter there is a clickable link and and there is also um, there is actually a github page for the book where all the files and can be down for the american users i noticed that everything is in metric which uh, makes sense given that you're located in um, europe um, but for american users who would um, open that up there's also the, the question of the library um, because the template will reference a library and if it's they're referencing the u.s library it wouldn't uh, have all the same components so do you provide some links for those yeah that's, that's a bit of a <laughs> more complicated thing i think um, yeah. we've been not aware of the complete setup of every language library uh, we noticed that for instance, the the, from the Dutch uh, Dutch, um, uh, Dutch Belgian library that we're most familiar with is derived from the international library. So with, to a large extent, these are the same objects with the same settings, but sometimes different translations and slightly organized differently. Of course, that is typically a challenge with with opening an external Archicad file. Do you have the same library objects, or would they reference a completely different library? Okay. So um, one thing yeah. that I can do, uh, if have you actually, I know Jared Banks did review the book and, and uh, made a glowing review, um, and I'm, so I'm sure there are others um, in the US uh, who have at least seen the book, uh, but if you haven't actually tested out the, the template and library issue, I can help you with that. Just, um, you know, perhaps uh, if there are some gaps or, you know, like, oh, they might not have access to such and such, then I can help you. Um, yeah. but, um, we, we based it on the international version and international template that is normally available for any um, uh, sub subscription users uh, at Graphisoft. So if you even have a localized version, you can still download the uh, international one. And that's okay. the, um, I think as, as it's a the, GitHub uh, repository, we still have the option of possibly adding onto that repository at some point. Yes, so maybe right. if there is a yes. reference sure. file that is a bit more tweaked to, to the, for instance, the US template, why not? It, it's, it's, it's a bit okay. difficult for us to also... provide all these languages, but I think we're open to, to sharing those on the, on the GitHub yes, page as well. Yeah. Well, um, we'll move on, but uh, yeah. an, open, an open offer if, uh, if I can help make it more fully functional for US users if there's an issue at all. Maybe there's no issue at all. Um, all right, so uh, uh, let's move on. What, what else? Uh, so, uh, can you just show the, the table of contents or the, the outline of the book? And just um, uh, you talked about uh, that, and you flipped a little bit to some pages. But do you, can you just bring up the um, contents and just sort of see what the um, the table of contents? Yeah. Okay. So as, right. as Stefan already said, how we, we start out with the book, I think one aspect is also important that we try to mimic a little bit uh, the design process or the modeling process in Archicad. What we find a lot of users, beginning to struggle with in Archicad is the fact that they tend to go into detail quite fast. So uh, as a designer, we know the real world, we, we know how to uh, develop a design. And then we get this wonderful three-dimensional tools allowing us to create a virtual building and we tend to go uh, into detail quite fast. But in the book, as you could see a few minutes ago, uh, we don't present a perfect uh, model from the very beginning. So we start out with a rough sketch and not all walls are connecting properly. Not all the slabs are correct uh, at uh, the, the exact height at, uh, at the start. And we develop this model as you would in a, in a real uh, life project. 
So we uh, change the wall settings, we choose another composite, we solve the, the, uh, the connections between the walls uh, within the group. So that's how we try to learn it. Can you flip through the, the uh, just so we yeah. see that? Because right now we're on the so, technical requirements here. So yeah, and then getting started with Archicad, how does it work? Work environment, and then we start building our basic residential model. That was what we were showing in a, a few minutes ago. So walls and slabs are being added. Uh, then adding roofs, zones, beams, and columns. So some other tools are shown uh, with the same uh, building. And then we go into uh, how to model a, a simple flat roof using a slab. So that's a common technique in our region. You can also use the roof tool, of course. So showing you, you some options, not like this is the one and only solution. I think Archicad has the benefit that you can choose the, the most fitting tool for the shape you want to develop. And then already tidying up the model. So it's a little bit messy in the beginning, it's a little bit rough, and we have to change wall composites for better connections and so on. And then we start adding some objects. So that's the first uh, jump into the library, so the very powerful parametric library of Archicad adding openings like uh, windows and doors, and also developing a stair, and then uh, looking at some objects and how, for instance, a kitchen object, a complicated kitchen object could uh, be functional in your design. And then we have like a basic model. So it's not finished, of course, it's uh, still a little bit rough, but then we take a look at, um, at something that's still important in a 3D BIM environment, and it's uh, using basic drafting tools and 2D views. So when, when you have your central, virtual building, you are going to derive uh, elevations and sections from your model. But you're also going to draw uh, some stuff yourself. So uh, you using a 2D field to create a, a backdrop, for instance, or something beneath your elevation. It's also necessary. And adding annotations like uh, dimension lines or text, uh, using a label uh, or uh, deriving a little bit of information from your model is also treated in this first part. So we have um, multiple parts in the book, um, I think two, and in the second part we start from this, let's say, pre-design of, of the, the project and develop it into a full, fully uh, documented model using some advanced uh, tools, uh, composite walls, how do they, they work, we already modeled them, but how do the composites and attributes work in Archicad, what are the Archicad priorities, giving you some in-depth uh, information on uh, layer intersection priority, but also, of course, building materials, junction order, and so on. So the most commonly known is, I think, the building material priority, but it's not the only one, and it's not the, the most powerful one, actually. Yeah? So that's some, some little bit more in-depth uh, knowledge of Archicad. Mm -hmm. And it gets a bit more complicated with the com uh, with stair options, using the mesh tool for your terrain, uh, of course, but also for uh, developing roofs. Maybe you can show that in a minute, how you can make a sloping a slope on a flat roof uh, using the mesh tool the renovation tool is not included in the in the project itself but we found it uh, quite important in uh, the current uh, design uh, world because we are renovating more and more buildings instead of building new ones at least uh, where we are working at this moment but i believe in you uh, said the renovation worlds. sorry ruben you said the renovation yeah. tool is not included with what with the project. So the project is like a new building and we are not uh, demolishing, uh, demolishing any walls or uh, something like that. But we do show how this tool works because it's a very powerful tool. Right. And it's important okay. in, a, in a curious practice uh, for architects. Maybe uh, it's it's good to uh, understand that in, in the second part, from time to time, we, we, we take a step back from the, from the project. So we, we didn't want to make one gigantic Frankenstein project with every possible tool. It's usually not 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 that easy sure. to work with. So rather, some of the subjects may may go into slightly independent, smaller projects, and then from time to time we return to to the residential projects. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um. So there is a a question from Dan Wyckoff saying, not being familiar with the Kindle format, is that format searchable? So I could search for fills, for example. Um. So you're looking at a PDF right now. So there is, uh, I, I noticed you had a, a scannable, um, what do you call it, uh, QR, QR code. QR code, yes. Yeah. So when you get the physical book, you can you know, scan that and get the PDF downloaded. And PDFs are searchable. So if you do, um, if you click up in the top right um, you know, of this window, 
if you can just do that right now so people can see. Um, there is a search area. You can click on that and you can type in some, type in the word fill, for example, or may I hour. Um, no, the PDF is fully searchable. That's, yeah. well, I assume, but I, I'm not a Kindle user, that in, in, in the ebook you would also have some possibility for searching. Yeah, with, with Kindle, there's actually, uh, yeah. There's actually a preview of the Kindle uh, version available on Amazon. So there you can see the functionalities, I suppose, of the Kindle version as well. Right. Yeah, and Linux Carl's, in a browser window. But, uh, yeah. One of the other members here is Carl Smith says, Kindle books are usually searchable. So yeah. Um, okay. So I think you've gone through most of the outline there. I know I had asked you to share um, you know, some projects and talk about things. You had the one with the curtain wall uh, that you had brought up on screen. and. And uh, I know one of the other things we talked about was BIM. And actually, this is now getting to the, the last part here. Talk a little bit about BIM and its relationship to Archicad, because not all Archicad users even know what the heck is BIM, or if they know in theory what it is, they haven't had experience necessarily doing a building information modeling project in collaboration with other companies. So just tell us a little bit about your background and let's take a look at that project. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, Stefan, I think you're the, the, the one to answer the question on the definition of BIM as you are a member of building smart. So if, 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 you, if you look at, at the current state of the construction sector, BIM is, is, is a very broad term, but in, in general, major aspects of BIM is that it's sharing digital information in a project to support design decisions. That's one of the main main characteristics of BIM, which means that rather than working in isolation, working within Archicad and producing drawings and, and giving drawings to, to, the, to the contractor or to the client, the models themselves will be shared. And the, one of the strengths of that approach it's of course that you you start coordinating, you start aligning the design, especially in, in when projects become more complex or we we'll have multiple partners. You use a lot of tools to visualize, to coordinate. You can perform all these kinds of analysis and, and, and quality checks. And of course, the end result in many cases and in many projects is still um, the set of drawings, but you're, you're sure. and. If, if you work with Archicad, you, you know this, but if you come from, from a more traditional drafting background, in, in a traditional drafting background, every drawing would be a separate thing. Would be You, you could try to, to align them more or less, but with the Archicad, which and embraces this, this BIM modeling methodology, everything is a single model. And the, the single model ID, even if the model might be split into separate files for, for, for various reasons, is still the idea. You have a master model and you extract what you can. You, if you need to count the, the, the area of windows, you use the model for that. If you need to make a, a cost estimation based on the, the square, square foot or the square meters of, of, uh, of the spaces, you use the Archicad zones, you set up categories, and then you can extract all that information and everything is always up to date. So if you're using Archicad to its fullest extent, you're already on, on well ahead to to start working in projects where, where collaboration is, is required. Obviously, there are Archicad is, is, is a very capable software tool, but there are other yeah. software tools. And one of the challenges that we often encounter in, in projects is that we, we might have to collaborate with other people using different tools or maybe using the same tools, but using a different methodology. And that is where you, we also start, and that's the type of work that, that, that Ruben is also showing, a project with different, different partners, different software tools, but we still have to coordinate. So maybe you can briefly show um, how this project is set up and, and, and from which yes. models it, it contains. Well, as, as Stefan is explaining how BIM is for us, a, a process in which you collaborate, I was showing a, a project that we did for um, EV, EVR architects, so EVR architects in Belgium, uh, for uh, Belidis and the University of Brussels, a new building that is now being constructed by Artes. I have to say some names to be able to show this. 
uh, as a disclaimer or as a some some uh, source of information. As you, and as you were seeing in Articat, we have this fully uh, this fully developed uh, model. And it's all, not only just the geometry; it's also full of uh, data, so information that is needed to coordinate this with the contractor. Um, this information is uh, typically stored in properties and then can be exported through the IFC translators into an IFC file. And that was, uh, was what I was showing in this uh, other uh, application called BIM Collab Zoom. I think it's well known internationally. It's one of the many IFC viewers which allows you to combine uh, several models. So we have uh, multiple uh, partners involved. It starts with an architect making a coordinated design and then later on you have an engineer and you have uh, contractors uh, that are going to build this model. And it was mandatory to do this the BIM way in this project specifically. So it was written by the client. We want IFC files. We want everything to be done in a BIM process to be well coordinated. And what we are viewing now is actually the model from the contractor uh, built with, if I'm not mistaken, with technical structures, so it's a different software. And we also have a model by um, the guys who are going to make the curtain roll that's modeled in Revit, as you can see, and it shows uh, quite well um, the developed way. It's not online, I'm seeing now. Uh, the developed way of uh, constructing this design that was made by the architect. So we have several uh, pieces of one puzzle coming together in this. Uh, federated model, as we call it, I suppose, of multiple IFC walls. And in this IFC viewer, I can click any element and I can see all the properties that were included in the ARCHICAD file. You can see it was made in ARCHICAD, but I can also derive some uh, information, uh, some naming. It's in Dutch, of course, so it's not all clear, but it's the outer shell, for instance. And we have uh, its uh, type that is used. You can also uh, have floors that have some basic information on the phasing or it's a new phase or also if you include it in your IFC export have the quantities included and the reference to the bill of quantities for instance so everything gets connected into this uh, one project and then as a as a BIM coordinator which is uh, I think a task uh, Stefan and I share in our companies so the studio and studio v3 um, we are uh, responsible for checking if this model uh, has any clashes with other disciplines, for instance, with the, the, the ventilation or the plumbing or whatever. So every pipe has a position. And one of the examples uh, specifically in this project is uh, the floor supports. So they are very, very tiny. I'll zoom in a bit. So it's all small columns, as you can see, uh, used for the, um, uh, the, high, the higher floors. I again forgot the right word, Stefan, in English. The, the raised floors. The raised, the raised floors, yeah, thank you. So in the raised floors, some techniques, some installations are included. So you have little legs every 60 centimeters to support these uh, floor tiles. And in between, ducts will be running with air and uh, cooling systems and so on. And the contractor wanted to check from the ARCHICAD model if there were going to be any clashes. I could select all of them and see if it works. And I can see I have 20,000 and, and a bit objects selected at the moment. So all of these legs were drawn in ARCHICAD or modeled. Of course, not by hand. For this, we used uh, a combination of Grasshopper, Rhino, and ARCHICAD. Uh, as many users probably uh, may know, you can combine these uh, technologies uh, to, to automate uh, parts of your modeling process. And a lot of times this is shown for developing like uh, spectacular uh, alt shapes and architecture. But you can also use it for repetitive drawing work, like in this example. We just got some images or some uh, DWGs from a subcontractor showing us the grid lines of the tiles, and we used the intersections between the lines to find the right position for the legs of the um, raised floors. And so we got a model um, that was generated for ARCHICAD instead of being modeled by hand. So can you? Um, show the whole model, but cut the section because um, you know uh, uh, you were showing a section through it. And by the way, that, that was in the BIM Collab Zoom um, coordination tool, where you basically identify clashes. You study things as opposed to doing the model. You're bringing in the model from different teams: the architectural mm -hmm. team, the structural team, etc. So. 
if we are looking at this whole thing and, and just zoom in on a, an area with that. No, no, leave that section. Yeah, sorry, open. sorry. Yeah, I misclicked. So I'll create a section plane. And then let's look at uh, the level of th things that are exposed when we're seeing the duct work and the raised floor. Where is that raised floor that had all of the, um, those little so elements? As you can see here, the, the uh, structural elements are actually not showing because in Belgium we have a different uh, type of contract. So we have an architect and we have an engineer and the engineer is responsible for the, um, the model of the structure. I don't have that model. I'm not the engineer of the project. But you can see uh, the, the little white uh, elements here are actually the legs of the raised floor. And here in between, we would have a beam, concrete beam and a floor uh, supporting these legs that are supporting the floor. Okay. So this is an incomplete model. You can see this is that... for us an incomplete model. Yeah, I can show you a complete model if you want to. Uh, so it's a different well, project. I think given this context, now I, I know we want to get back to the general Archicad stuff, but it is good to go into the BIM enough. Yes, here we're seeing now. Um, here you see all the elements and the, and the, and the coordinated uh, model of the architect, but we leave out the um, structural elements and the exports. So we use a little trick for that in Archicad. Okay, uh, so you're bringing into the Archicad model the IFC data, which is both geometry, you know, where the things are, and some attribute information. Like if you click on it, you could say, I presume, how strong is this structural beam? You know, what is it yeah. made of? Um, and yeah. then, of course, see the visual conflicts as well as potentially think. Yes. Hey, that really going to work? I, I'm going to ask them about it. I'm going to flag this as a potential, you know, question. Um, yeah, yeah. So you, you're going to look for clashes or problems, even design problems. So if uh, we are using this technology with a design team, in the beginning they're a bit hesitant. They are just delivering the IFC models, but in a, within a few weeks they see the benefit of communicating through this uh, technology using a view like this and saying, okay, uh, you don't like the position of this door because the duct has to move or whatever. So that's a design question. It doesn't have to be a physical clash. It also, also brings all these disciplines uh, together in a virtual uh, three-dimensional way, which is a big step forward as compared to a uh, traditional 2D workflow where you have to superimpose several plans and you don't have the, the 3D impact of, for instance, a ventilation duct. So that's always difficult to assess in a design uh, tra trajectory. So I know you're, uh, both of you work as consultants. In addition to the teaching, you work as consultants for firms and you're regularly, uh, as part of the work, um, coordinating files like we're seeing here. Uh, I'm just going to ask you, are there some still some major issues with this coordination or is it pretty much now with IFC you just make sure you have common origins and common definitions and everything just you know everybody can see each other's work if, if everything would be perfect we would have any uh, would, would have that job anymore we would have other jobs of course <laughs> but the the, yeah. the reality is that it, it takes a lot of of defining agreements and like you rightfully say one of the first things i need to decide where, where is where is the the origin of the project are we working in the same position that's otherwise it's, it makes no sense to start combining models or doing clash detection or these kinds of operations and which means it's it requires quite some preparation at the beginning of the project but with with um, more and more of the clients we work for or, or the owners um, they they start demanding this more and more. They they see the value of it. They see the value of of having a project which avoids conflicts rather than having a battle of of many different uh, challenging discussions. And um, if 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 it all goes well, it's it's it should pay for itself in the sense that you avoid issues, you avoid problems, you solve things in a virtual model and can refine it before you start going to a construction site. And that is Ruben, do you have another project that you want to bring up? Just because while we're talking, it, it could yeah, yeah. be. Um, so go I'm on. To, uh, yeah. You say you need some agreements, you need some, um, you know, the framework of the origin, etc. Et and I assume there's always some questions of, um, you know, who's in control of what 
things, who's going to be reviewing, what's the time frame, how often is it updated, um, uh, who maintains the, the combined model, or is it a federated model where you have a copy of my stuff and I have a copy of your stuff and we're just both doing our, our work? Um, These are all, all, all very, very valid questions, and, and it, it's, it indeed means you, you need to define it. And depending on, on the type of project, um, the owner may define a lot of those requirements, but it is also possible that they say, let's, well, I hire an architect or I hire an engineering office and, and let them figure it out. And I'm only interested in receiving a product, project in the end. Both cases are valid, depends on, on typically on the client if they, they have a, an interest in the models or do they actually need the models at all that that's also an important question and it's something you need to to ask yourself at the beginning of the project what is the purpose of the model is it only for the architect to ensure that they get their construction drugs out of the door or or is it also uh, something that the the contractor will take over and continue the models in, during the construction phase will they deliver shop drawings will they deliver a model and the more and more of these agreements you can define in advance, um, the more predictable the process becomes. So oh, what we typically want to ensure is that, that we ask the right, the right questions at the beginning of the project, so everybody is on the same page. We yeah, understand where, where we are heading, what is the maturity, which are the software tools being used in the project, one tool, many different tools. Let's assume, let's assume that uh, just for the sake of a scenario that you have some experienced teams who have done coordination before and they have you know latest version of ArcticCAD, Revit, ECLA, etc. Is it now becoming just routine? Just you, you you have an initial meeting or two, you set up certain things, you you say here's how we're going to share files and everybody does their work. Are there, are there issues still just tech, technology wise that um, are tricky, or is it just now it's sort of routine? I would I would say if if you ask for the technology, the technology is there, and you're, you're, all the the software tools you mentioned are there already for a long time. And our architect turned forty uh, some time ago, which is, is in software terms, it's it's a dinosaur, and at the same time, it's 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 modern, it's up to date, it's it's still being developed. So the tools are there. Of course, the more the, these tools, the, the, the more powerful they become, the more that our expectations rise with the tools, and with the, the models become more complex. Yeah, it's applied in in larger projects, but also we we model to to more detail. Typically, this it's it's even with with the current generation of, of modern computers and, and and more expansive cpus and gpus we still push the limits of, of the machines the, the models that we show especially if you look at, at an map model or a series of map models they, they, they can become very taxing on, on the hardware and in that sense we we always encounter that the modeling environment rcat or Revit or any of the other tools have a very different way to optimize. But if you look at what, what Ruben is showing now on, on, on the screen, this is uh, about 10 different models, which is which are visualized in real time. Of course, slightly less sophisticated than you would show them in, in Archicad. It's not with the textures or the shadows or, or all the hatches included. But for for this type of work, for this type of coordination and, and model checking, it's it's more than enough. It's it's still understandable. People understand what they are seeing. They see the integration of how these 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 ducts and these, these large packages for for the ventilation ducts fit or don't fit within within the, the rooms, within the the shafts, within the, the technical floors. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we have a question from uh, Melinda Streit. Uh, is ArchiCAD an alternative to Revit or does it work with Revit? Um, so absolutely it works with Revit in terms of I'll do my design, you'll do your mechanical, um, and we will share the files together. Uh, to what extent is ArchiCAD now becoming an alternative to Revit in doing this BIM? Uh, obviously, all of you who are on this call 
I'm assuming our ARCHICAD users either 100% or you, you know, it's a significant part of your interest in your world and you're doing design for architecture or landscape or whatever it is. So you're saying, I'm gonna use ARCHICAD instead of Revit. But when we talk about, is it an alternative to Revit? Let's talk about the specialty things. Revit has a structural package. Revit has a mechanical package. You know, they, in addition to modeling duct work, they can do some analysis, I assume, to say, is this going to be sufficient? You know, the sizing, is it going to, you know, handle the load, et cetera. So from what I understand, Archicad can model most things other than, say, Frank Gehry type of, uh, you know, morphed shapes. You know, you could Which do would it. Be a challenge, would be a challenge in any software. To be honest. <laughs> But, but aside from that, you can model everything, but it's the analysis um, that uh, and the may, maybe the manufacturer's components that are built in, you know, to mm -hmm. libraries that would be the main. What, what we typically see is that the, the, especially the multidisciplinary projects, when, when we see architect, architect being used, it's quite often with the architectural teams. Uh, that's, yes. that's clear. However, we see more and more that the, the MEP modeler is now the included in Archicad by default. So it, it is possible to model at least um, some of the ducts and the pipes without yeah. switching software, which was less so in, in the past. The same with, with the structural analytical model, you can set up quite an extensive structural model. But at the same time, to perform the structural calculations, you would again need to send that model to an external software analysis tool. Um, yeah. But I'd, I'd say the scope or the overlap between the software is is is, is growing. It's yeah, they're they're direct competitors, and at the same time, we we see them being both applied in, in software in in. Yeah. Uh, in projects at the same time. What okay. we think works really well today is coordination, ensuring that we bring the models together as long as we figure out the, the correct alignment and the positioning, that works fine. What to me is still challenging is the full transfer of a model to another software tool because the, inherently they work different. If you say we, we start with an architectural model in Archicad, and we send it to a contractor who's only working in TechCloud or in Revit and he needs to take over the model, that is still challenging in the sense that there is a lot of additional work, some remodeling. Sometimes they prefer to start from scratch. But for coordination, for aligning the design, I think you can use them perfectly well. We, we, we have projects where, where the software tools are not a limit or not, not a limiting factor. Right. But full transferring between software tools using IFC um, and using all the knowledge we have, we still encounter certain yeah, challenges and yeah, not maybe we're, we're not able to solve everything perfectly, but that's that's reality at the moment. But interoperability is getting better at every version and in between versions in all the software. So they, they know each other and they get to know each other better every time, I think. That's at least what I believe. So as Stefan was, was talking, I just showed that in this example, the architecture model is Archicad, the stability, so the structure model is done in Alplan, and uh, the technical models are done in Revit. So we have three different contractors or uh, engineers and designers, and they use their own software that, that fits their job in the best way. So that's, I think, an important uh, uh, argument for, for choosing your software. Yeah. But, but it, uh, to confirm the reply to, to the question from Elinda, yes, it's an alternative, but we see in practice that they're often used by different disciplines. Yeah. Um, but we see, I'm not sure if we can expand it to, to, to all the projects in the world, but, but at least in, in our area and in the projects we're involved in, that there is an openness to, to using open BIM workflows and even in projects where everybody's using the same tool, even then tools like BIM Collapse Zoom or Solibri are being applied for their efficiency with model coordination or, or model checking. So, you know, in the US where I'm based and I'm not sure about Melinda, um, you know, Archicad is not nearly as large a presence in the market as it is in say Europe. Uh, or maybe Japan and some other places like New Zealand, uh, where you know it is a very major player. Here in the U.S., it is a 
a, a noted player and respected, but you know the larger firms in dealing with large projects like this uh, often will say, well, I can't use ArcCAD, even though I, I used to use it in my own office, but I, I have to use Revit because everybody else is using Revit. And it, what I'm seeing is that's sort of a, uh, a bias. It's, it's based on incomplete um, knowledge of how workflow actually happens. And, um, you know, just like old stereotypes related to age or race or, you know, background, uh, you know, get changed when people meet a Chinese person and say, I like you. And I thought Chinese person, you know, whatever, the, you know, whatever that stereotype is, you, you work with Archicad and you sent me this file and, well, you know, okay. Um, so over time, I think as we have more of these projects in Europe and Japan and other places where the interdisciplinary and inter, um, let's say, well, the, the exchange between different software platforms becomes commonplace, you know, that'll become more accepted. Um, so, yeah. Uh, it, it's no. something we, we push on quite hard in, in, in also in the consulting, but also in the work for standardization to to ensure that the, the open standards are, are have their rightful place in projects. But we're also pragmatic if, if if you need to send a file from 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 architect A to, to to engineer B and use the same tool, you don't have to go through a separate format for that. So it really depends mm -hmm. on, on the context. But we try to convince owners that even if, if they say we well, let's 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 for, force yeah, let's demand Mount Revit. We say no. You have to ensure that you get the open data, that you get access to to the end results. And Archicad or Revit or Tecla, they're all quite mature on that level already. Yeah. Right. Now, by the way, in terms of um, the cloud computing stuff, uh, are you routinely using, you know, the BIM server in, up in the cloud? Um, you know, is that how most of these projects are run? Um, yes, uh, I, I use the, the BIM Cloud uh, with all of my students every year. So we create a cloud with 80, 80 plus users. So that's, I think, the biggest one <laughs> in Belgium. It runs smoothly for uh, uh, for the last, I would say, seven years. It runs uh, very smoothly. Before that, we had some hiccups, but it's fine now. It's a really good technology because you can uh, create a model with several people at the same time. And you have a safe backup of your of your model uh, online in the cloud. You can manage users and so on. So our, our students are very happy with that too because then they can do a lot of lot more stuff in the same amount of time. They don't have to wait for their colleagues to finish the job. They also learn how to make some agreements on who is going to do what, uh, in which way. We have to agree on layer names. We have to agree on materials. So that's a really good preparation for the real life world. And actually, all of our clients, so architectural firms, use the same technology. Even if someone is working independently on a project, they put it on a BIM server because in the sight of a deadline, probably someone will join to finish the project and to make the layouts and to start making schedules and so on. So that's but also all very for, beneficial. For backup, or for backup purposes, or there is a computer program you can run on another tool and the data is already there, even if your hard drive is crashing. So. Even in a single person office, it makes sense to, to work in BIM, in the BIM cloud on, on, on the local server or on a cloud server. It's, it's all possible. Right, okay. Um, so I'm gonna just, uh, we're a little over an hour. We still have a bit more time reserved uh, with you. Um, so I'm gonna say, if anyone has any questions that you'd like to post in here, please do so now or soon. I'm wondering if you have other, files that you wanted to open or other examples things that you you know because i asked you to say hey um yeah. you know do a little bit of teaching or sharing some of your tips and uh, yeah so maybe uh, i'll just uh, jump back to the book if that's fine uh, for you eric uh, um, i prepared something on on the roof you were uh, watching i think it's this page so uh, i don't know how how you guys do it in the us if you model a roof there are several options Personally, that's one of the things I like best um, from this uh, software is that you are not obliged to use uh, the tool called Roof Tool for designing roofs. Of course, that's the first choice, but sometimes a slab tool can be more interesting. If we have a flat roof in a pre-design stage, 
a lot of times it's uh, developed with slab two because it's just a flat surface so it's not uh, stuck to categories so in the book it's one of the of the, the pro tips uh, we call them we give us is this example where we have basically flat roof but of course we need a slope to get the, the water uh, from this flat roof into a gutter and down the drain and we can actually see this in this uh, larger project uh, applied in real life so uh, to achieve this we have uh, not one uh, composite we have several uh, elements uh, layered on top of each other. So at the bottom layer, I'll, I'll isolate um, these elements to have a better view. Like this. So at the bottom we have um, just a slab for the floor or the concrete structure in this example. And at the top for the slope, we have a, a composite uh, that is done with the roof too, so that has a continuous slope in one direction, and the other half in the opposite direction. This is the gutter, and in between you have a layer that has a flat bottom and a sloping uh, top. So for that, we would use the mesh tool, because that's the one tool that can have a flat surface on on one side and a sloping uh, surface on the other side. In this way, you are creating a layered structure that has. Um, really good uh, uh, connection with reality. So in a developed design like this example, that's what we would need because we want the right um, uh, quantities for, for the discrete but also for the installation that is sloping and for the, the top layers. And we want, want a good representation in our section views that we can see the color that we are sure that the slope has the right percentage and so on. But in a first draft, this was not uh, modeled in uh, three separate elements. It was one one big component, uh, probably a slab, that has these uh, three layers combined in the composite definition. So that's uh, one of the things we also show in the book. You can see in this um, example, I don't know if, uh, if you want me to, to model it live, uh, that would be interesting. I could do that, but uh, I don't know if it adds value to what I just explained. Um, sure, if there's something you want to demonstrate, uh, just in terms of how, how you're coordinating the heights uh, of those things, and you're checking the slope, you know, because that's always a question. Well, how do you know what the slope is? And, uh, you know, do you cut a section? You know, what do you, what do, you do? Yeah. So I would start out with, uh, so right now I, I chose to, to use the uh, national template as in the book. I would start out with a, a simple slab. It's just an example, so it's not real life. And then to define the slope, so that would be done at the top. So that would be modeled with a uh, roof. And then, of course, if we are talking about them, we should take into account that uh, if you choose the roof tool by default, this would be categorized as a roof in IFC terms. And my slab is not a roof, so that's an IFC slab, but we can change that in the settings of the uh, slab tool. So it's one of the properties, so classifications and properties. We classify this not as a slab, but we choose a roof. If we then would export this, this slab would be recognized in other software as being a roof, a part of a roof. So that's one benefit we have in Archicad. So still I have like one slab. I need to add my slope. So that's the next step. I'm going to use a, um, a single plane um, roof. So the geometry work is a single plane. And I'm going to um, use uh, the easiest geometry uh, construction method. So my pivot line, um, yeah, just put it at this position, giving a slope upwards to the right. And I'm modeling my uh, roof on top of the other one. I could use the, the magic wand, of course, to do this a little bit more quick, but that's okay. I can select my roof, and then I should be able to give it the right uh, slope. In the settings, uh, I've selected my slab with my roof. So this is a roof, sorry for that. 45 degrees is a little bit much, I think, for a flat roof. So it would be typically um, calculated not in degrees, but in percentage in our region. So I will switch to percentage that's easier to set. So 45 degrees is 100%. So every meter that you go horizontal, it raises a, a meter as well. So let's set this like to 2%. It would be quite common for uh, having your water from the rain going down to the gutter on a flat roof. And this is set at 2%. I think then would be a good time to add a section. If 
preferably perpendicular to your uh, slope so that we can see the position of the elements uh, easily. My uh, roof is not at a roof story, but that doesn't matter that much, I think, for the example. And this should be closer to my uh, slab, of course, not actually on top, but somewhere there. And in between now, I would need the mesh. I hope the, the, the sketch is clear so far. So as you can see, this is not fully developed, not yet. Talk about, but talk about the, the home story. So right now, that roof, what is the home story of the roof? Let me check the home story is now on the ground floor because and I was modeling on the ground floor. It would be at, at the second story, of course, so that would make more sense. So it was set to live and be shown on plan on the ground floor, even though it was up covering the walls of the ground floor. Um, mm -hmm. Now you've moved it down and it still is considered part of the ground floor. Just as a little tech note for you know uh, people watching, um, you can move elements up and down in space, either in a section or in 3D, anytime you want, and they will stay associated with their home story, whatever you um, chose. But if you decide later on, oh, I want to see this on the upper floor or on you know, the uh, subterranean, a negative story or something like that, you can reassign the, the home story. There are two ways to do it. One is you can actually select it from the dialog box, but that will tend to move it in space because it'll keep the offset. It'll say, I'm so I'm a certain distance from the reference line of that story. But there is another way where you right click on the element. Just do you want to show that? Yeah. Uh, can I show this way first? I have a little a trick for that one. So what you were saying, Eric, if I change it here, uh, to, uh, it has to be on story two. This value changes. That moves it up in space. So it's to... Uh, the project zero, it's now 12,000 instead of 6,000. But just before that, I copied my uh, original value into my clipboard so I can uh, paste it back. And it's set to the second story, but it stays at the right offset. So that's a little workaround for that problem. If you do this in um, this dialog box, I'm going to cancel to show the other option. So if you right click, and then you can um, relink the home story. So that's what, what you were saying, I think. In the mm -hmm. uh, contextual menu, link the home story, and then go to second story. Anyway, before you click, just when you oh, open the relink home story, there's a, a little mention at the bottom. When you change the story, ele element elevation and height values remain unchanged. So you can reassign it. So, you know, I want to see it on another story, but it'll just stay in the same position in space in terms of elevation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So let's do that uh, for this element as well. Now they are configured a little bit more correctly, I suppose. And then would be the time to uh, add my mesh to um, this model. Oh, sorry. I would typically switch to 3D view now because uh, the mesh is, uh, has to be sloping. Also get to my uh, slab. I'm not looking into the, the composites that are being used, so the materials are wrong. It's just uh, the structure that I want to uh, show you. By the way, you just isolated that slab. Can you just you use the keyboard shortcut? So let's just make sure people understand that. Um, so when you have an element selected or multiple elements, there's the option to show selection. We use it all the time on plan. You draw a marquee or you select some elements, and then you say, show that in 3D. But you can also do it in 3D and say, I just want to look at this wall and how it meets the roof and something. So you select one or more elements and then say, temporarily just show that. And so when yeah. you do that command, either keyboard shortcut or not, it will allow you to isolate. Now, it doesn't prevent other things from being seen, but show, uh, shows just selection. Yeah. And now we yeah. can easily see the top surface and draw the, the mesh on top of it. Um, as these are on, on two different layers, you could also use uh, the quick layers uh, palette for that. So that's also yeah. one I like. It gives you more control. It's not active at the moment. So that could be find, uh, found in palettes and then uh, quick layers. I think yeah, it's at the bottom. So quick layers here. It gives us this little uh, menu uh, bar. 
and you can say okay uh, hide the selections layer or the other layers so you have like a negative way of doing this it's uh, really uh, easy when you're modeling PD. so I'll hide this one it gives us the same result benefit being that I can go back like an undo in this uh, layer combination so it's uh, really interesting um, when you're hiding and showing layers all of the time you don't have to go into the layer settings you can just use the quick layers for that so what I still need is like uh, a mesh it's a complex mesh with uh, several uh, points of height and it's just uh, one slope I'm going to uh, activate the mesh tool and use this uh, rectangular geometry method so I have a certain height but I will uh, solve this in three uh, D few minutes so it uses a top surface to be modeled that can be set uh, as a new slab. Let's move that up. Is it at the right height? Has to move no, it's a little bit higher. So to align it with the top surface of my original uh, slab, it doesn't have a slope yet. So to show um, everything again, I'm going to go back in my uh, quick layer settings. Then you can see, I don't know if it's clear for you on the, on the shared screen, here we have like the, the roof sitting in between. I'm going to adapt the height of my um, endpoint or my uh, contour points of my uh, mesh to the height of this uh, sloped roof. It's done uh, using the pad palette. And we are going to change the elevation or elevate the mesh point. And then we can just ref graphically reference to the correct height make sure I'm clicking the right point so at the bottom of the sloping roof I have to do this four times of course uh, four uh, corners shouldn't be any grass in the in the layered structure of my roof but I think you get the the general workflow of developing developing a, a little bit more detailed sloping um, surface on a flat roof. So that's the finished um, All right. result. Maybe I'll just uh, move some edges so we see the different layers of the cake. And of course, the next steps would be um, adding the right materials and removing this uh, uh, surface uh, override or this model uh, override. So we don't have to cross. And that's how we do that. And that's how we did it in this. Uh... Show the section again. Ah, sorry. Uh, go back to the section. Yes. All right. So now we can see that uh, the intermediate element is the mesh. If you just select the intermediate one and just show that what element is. Uh... Is that so one is the mesh mesh tool? The upper one is a roof, and the lower one is uh, the slab. And then, of course, um, you can designate that mesh as a roof. So if you go into your um, settings uh, for... So you can do it in the info box as well. So it's site geometry by default. You can choose or we can search. That's really a comfortable function in, um, in ArchiCAD 26. So we can search uh, almost everything. So now it's classified as a flat roof IFC wise. It's still modeled with the, the mesh tool, of course, so it's still a mesh in ARCHICAD terms. Yeah, so in, uh, in which it's, it's a roof. Yeah, because okay. with, with your audio being a little bit hard to follow, you know, at least for me, I um, want to say, so designating something like that mesh as a roof is only important if you're doing analysis either inside ARCHICAD or collaborating with uh, another company that pays attention to, well, what are these things, right? Um, you know, the geometry, it looked fine. He just changed a, a setting about the data. So why is data important? Well, you know, if you wanted to get a, a quantities for roofing, or if you wanted um, to uh, you know, isolate just the roofs, or, you know, a whole variety of things that are based on, um, intelligent categories. ARCHICAD is flexible. You can draw things with different tools. You can make a wall and say, this is a cabinet, um, you know, part of a cabinet. You can make 
um, you know, a, a column and say that this is a pipe, you know, and things like that. So um, the there's a native thing when you draw with the column tool, it says this is a column, but you may say no, actually I'm using this to make a round pipe. Or uh, so ArcAD is very flexible, but it does have defaults when necessary or when useful. Uh, you should go into the classification and change that um, so you can, um, you know, communicate better or analyze better. It's something that I also want to confirm that um, more and more ArchCAD is evolving, the more and more the classification system and the property system is becoming at the core of how you organize information. As, as, as long as you're only focusing on the graphical outputs, the, for the drawing it doesn't matter if it's a roof or if it's a slab or if it's if it's something else but of course once you start using the model for for extracting information for quantity takeoff and for sharing with others it's it's really important and that's where you also see the evolution that initially a lot of the things were based on the category of the internal category of architect and you have a you have the slab tool you have the the window tool, you have all the different tools, but then you have these generic things like shell or morph, which are just shape, and you still have to de decide what, what what is their function, what is their meaning, and that is where the classification is, is is very important, and especially if you have to exchange models, for instance, using IFC, classification is the primary way to ensure that your model will will become a valid IFC file and a usable IFC file. Even even if you if if you wouldn't see any visual difference on your your floor plans, right? And I noticed recently when when one of the 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 exercises we did with our students is they they start with making a model for themselves initially in the first few exercises, but the last exercise is about exchange. And there, of course, they have to send export the model and and use it for this is in Solibri for an analysis. And at that point, they they become really aware of of how important it is to to give everything a proper meaning, especially the the the, the exercise where they make schedules. If you if you filter, and then you have to be really careful. Once you start diverging a bit from default category, the default element type that you would get in your schedule, you have to be a bit careful. If if you start doing measurements of, of everything that is, is a slab, but you have used slabs for tabletops, or you have to do slabs for uh, ceilings, or you have used them for uh, floor finishing, then you really have to make the distinction. It can, there are countless ways to make that filtering, but classification is, is one of those. Yeah. And this is where Archie gets, uh, because I'm, I'm, it's, it's something we, we noticed in projects where the classification system is, goes deep, but it's, it's, it's very fundamental to how Archicad is evolving. So you would have, I think you should embrace the system and to use it to your advantage. So I'm, I'm just gonna, you know, point out the book again. This is not just learn Archicad. This is a BIM professional's guide to learning Archicad. So if you are a BIM professional or want to be a BIM professional, not just an architect, not just an Archicad user, but you want to use BIM, and be in position to share, analyze, um, you know, work with projects in a more uh, fully intelligent way, then you'll want to pay attention to these things. Uh, obviously, this book will be one of one of the assets that you can add to your library. It's like fifty dollars on Amazon, so it's it's really very inexpensive investment. Um, and even though I had a digital copy sent to me, I decided I'm going to buy this and have you know have um, there. So, um, are there other things that you wanted to show? We're at the 90 minute mark. We could finish up now or soon. There is um, some slight technical thing, but maybe it's an interesting thing that I briefly want to show, especially since we're talking about classifications. So, shall I switch you to be you the presenter then, Stefan? Yes, that would be that would be okay. nice. Okay, so go ahead. And while you're doing that, I do see um, Eric Reinhard made a, um, let's say, a question or a comment about BIM Collab. This is, it looks like bimcollab.com is software from Europe. Autodesk also has a project, a product, BIM Collaborate, different tools and products with similar names. 
it looks like Bim Collab Zoom is a free viewer and he, he didn't know the cost of the Autodesk product. So is that true, the BIM Collab Zoom is a free product? There are two versions, and the, the basic version is free. And you can do quite a lot of stuff with that. If you're into, interested in this IFC workflow, I think that's a, it's a good option to start with. The, the paid version has some more options for clashing and, and making quantity yeah. lists. You can grow into a paid version later on. Right, yeah. okay. It's BIM, B-I-M-C-O-L-L-A-B. So the first part of the word, collaborate. BIM collab, and then it's dot zoom or or well anyway, just if you search for BIM collab, you know you'll find it. All right, so Stefan, do you know how to share your screen? Yes, but I'm hoping I'm not getting kicked out by by the Mac. Let me see if it works. You have to give permission to um for yeah, but if they permission, but after I gave permission, it might be necessary. Yeah, let me try. Yeah, at work. We're seeing the whole seeing screen. A lot. Um, <laughs> okay. So do you see which screen to let's? By the way, Paul Adams says he ordered a copy of your book this morning. Looking forward to upping his game. So that's that's great, Paul. So, yeah. Thanks for that. Okay. Let me see. So you should be able to see a small Excel file and. Text code file. Yeah, we heard it. We see yeah. a, a, an Excel file with a, a white background and then the, the code yes. file. Okay, then you see in the right view. So, talking about classifications, um, one of the nice things in Archicad is that you create your own classifications. But if you want to start from a classification that already exists, it might be really, really a lot of work. Uh, if you if you would go into um, the classification manager, let me bring that in. You can of course say, let's start a new classification system. Um, again, something, whatever it is, and add, add some leaves. Let's, and they, you can build a whole tree, but of course, this is nice for a small tree. You can, you can use it for whatever you want. But that becomes really complex if you you look at, for instance, this this is it's in French, so <laughs> don't don't be, be alarmed. But this is an example of, of a, a code for for bills of materials uh, that's used in Belgium, in the French-speaking part of Belgium, and it is delivered as a series of Excel sheets, um, and each of them having hundreds to over a thousand lines, and we want to bring that ev all. This whole classification, we want to bring it into Archicad to be able to assign that number to to materials. Of course, it's well, it's 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 almost impossible to do that step by step in Archicad. So rather than than uh, clicking in the classification manager for a few days, I actually wrote. You said, okay, maybe I can automate this work. So rather and for that. Um, I jumped into a Python script and a small Python script which runs through the Excel sheet, looking at the numbers, looking at the descriptions, and actually translate them into an Archicad classification system. And the nice thing is that we can have actually generated using a script the whole structure of an Archicad classification, which is an XML file, uh, which is quite extensive, but it's something that we can then import inside Archicad as a new classification system. Um, let me think that was this one. And it's a file, it's about almost two megabytes, but Archicad is importing it. If I pick up the right dialog box, here it is. And now we have the whole system with all the chapters, the same as we had in the Excel sheet, a different chapters, different branches, different leaves. And from there on, you can bring in a whole system. And maybe it took some efforts and a few tries and trials and errors to get it right. But I know if, if maybe in a few months time, we will get an update of that system as a new version will be published. We can look again at the script, maybe make a small, few small. Let, let, uh, let, let, me, let me back out about this. So there are, category there are systems <clears throat> for talking about 
the built environment, talking about design, talking about construction, that are done by all sorts of bodies, all sorts of associations, national, regional, industry specific, et cetera. And they all have some value because you know people have said, you know, we need to talk about these things and differentiate between the facade of this and the, you know, and use of something, you know. So all of these different ways of talking about things. Now Archicad has some built-in classifications that are reasonably intelligent and reasonably universal. But uh, if you have to meet the criteria for certain type of, you know, building owners or green building or, you know, um, you know, nuclear fabrication facilities that have to be, you know, have certain safety things. So there are requirements <clears throat> for classifying things and analyzing things. <clears throat> so what I'm seeing here is, A, Archicad is not wedded to a particular system. It's a framework that you can use and talk to anybody. You can learn, you know, Archicad can learn the language of any classification system. Secondly, we have, of course, Excel and other tools that are very widely used. Well, this Python script that you showed, at least very briefly, uh, is that something that you developed to ingest an Excel file and create the XML? Yes, because initially, as, as most people, I guess, we started trying to figure it out in Excel, but once you copied over a few uh, 20, 30 lines, it's, it's, it's really boring and it's also a lot of chance of making mistakes. Okay. I noticed in the Archicad forums that some people were struggling with that. So in this case, this is something that, that you could automate. Okay. And in fact, so, this is one of the, the system that is now also published on the Archicad uh, content page. So it, ha it was contributed to Graphisoft, I think uh, via um, the, the distributor of the French speaking part of Belgium. Okay, so you you personally or your company created this script? Um, yes, I, I did that as a as an exercise, as a mental right. exercise, I would say. Um, um, so but it's not that long. Python is quite efficient once you get to know it. So Archicad, uh, let me just also again set a context. I've been working with Archicad for God, 33, 34 years now. Um, we've had built in since the very beginning a, a tool called GDL, and most of you have heard at least the name. Some of you may have uh, gotten into doing some GDL coding or at least opening a GDL script and looking at it. Um, ge geometric description language, very, very simple programming language for creating forms and categories. I mean, it, it can, you know, it can deal with this is a shape, it we're going to call it this, we're going to make it look like that in terms of a texture or a surface, etc. Um, now, in recent years, Graphisoft has started to expand the ability for Archicad to use other programming languages that have other strengths. Python is one of them. I haven't worked with Python, but I do have a programming background. So when I look at that, I go, oh, okay, I can sort of see, sort of see the basic idea here. So without necessarily being a computer expert, but just having some programming knowledge, one can enhance Archicad. One can make it more powerful or flexible or sophisticated using programming tools. So you've used it for a very special purpose, importing an Excel file, doing some manipulation with the data and putting it in a format that Archicad can read. So Ray, this is now available on your website or on the Graphisoft website or what? I think the classification was is now available in the content page. Um, the, what are they, the, Python, the Python script is available where? Um, no, the Python script itself is, is just an internal script that I wrote. But I, it was discussed on the Archicad forum, so I, I showed some some examples in, in one of the forum posts. So if somebody recently. had a need, I mean, it's it, we, we have about 70 people still on the line, but there will be hundreds who will watch this uh, at some point or another. If somebody has a need for doing a classification system, can they contact you to get access to the Python script or can they send you an Excel file and you'll just, you know, turn it into this for them or what? Um, 
well, we, we can take a look at that. It's depending on the system, it might be straightforward. It might be take a lot of hurdles, but yeah, why not? It's, the the thing is, and and maybe I want to to also link to that. Um, one of the the strengths of of of, of Archicad is is of course the different ways to expand this because uh, Graphisoft can cannot cater for every possible country with every possible variation or every company internal system. Mm -hmm. So they they of course the GDL is is there from the beginning and for for objects it's 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 a very strong system but you have to of course learn a bit the coding itself. Quite recently they well they they expanded the the extension with with the Python environment it's still a bit limited it's not everything is covered but you can already start doing some manipulations and i hope that they, they will expand the, the coverage of the the python scripting and of course if you want to really go get your hands dirty then then there is also the the software developer kits but then it's it's real advanced c++ programming um I've done a bit of that in the past, but now some of my colleagues do that for clients. So it's part of our consulting. We sometimes develop Archicad plugins, and this is where you really can expand the software. And in this right. case, I'm just preparing a data file to be imported in the right structure that Archicad understands. Okay. Of course, so if, you, if you say we want to add some new functionality, that would not be possible with, with just a small script. So then you really have to dive deeper into, but it, it is possible, but the, the, the step is still still bigger. It is sometimes something we we have done for some of our clients already. Okay, so <clears throat> I'll just put it out there for any of you watching this live or in the recording. If you have a technical question that you think someone very knowledgeable in the technology of Archicad could help you with, send a message to me. I'll connect you up with Stefan and Ruben if you feel they might be a good resource. I may be able to, um, uh, you know, connect you with others for other types of things. Um, so my email address <clears throat> for these sort of things would be support at bobro.com. Now, Stefan and Ruben, um, uh, you want to share your websites, um, you know, uh, just uh, tell us what they are, um, you know, in terms of what would be the best place to find more information about you um well yeah we can we can share the site or if people think these days a linkedin connection is, is typically the best way to to get introduced and to start conversation so we're okay. really open to that sharing, um you know make yourself presenter again and uh and just share your website just bring it up for a moment and then there is one question um <clears throat> posted earlier that uh, maybe we can spend a few minutes just talking about. So um, Paul Adams asked, what are some of the best practices for getting automatic annotation in Archicad? Um, so it's sort of an open-ended question. What does automatic annotation mean? I'm gonna assume that one part of it has to do with um, dimensioning and you know, just saying, let's do some exterior dimensioning or let's do dimensioning across, you know, sort of a section line. And then another part, uh, would be uh, putting in um, information uh, for, um, you know, what, what is this element and what is the drawing note? And so you can then say that a label will pull up some information yeah, from yeah. the element. So those would be two things, and maybe you can demonstrate uh, a little bit of each of them. Um, well, the la label is obviously a very powerful tool. It, it's, it's suspiciously simple when you start working with it. You say just a text node, but once you understand that, it can extract yes, data I'm from. I just um, bring up your. Uh, I'll make you presenter again, and yes. just bring up your website for a moment, um, and then bring up Archicad and and just um, you know take five or ten minutes just to show a couple of things about the automatic annotation that we're talking about. Right. Yeah. So first, yeah, my, the company um, I'm, I'm, I'm a partner in is, is D Studio. Um, it's, we actually were in our 20th year um, this year, so we're celebrating ourselves a bit. But um, rather than being uh, an architectural company or an engineering company, we are um, 
a services company. We provide BIM-related services. So it means that, um, both the, the, the examples we gave on, on coordination, on project management, developing uh, BIM execution plan and these kinds of things. Um, but also, um, we're also doing some, some development services. So the integration tools, maybe it's a script, maybe it's a plugin, and we, we've developed um, an add-in for, for instance, for, for a BIM track uh, to connect BIM track to um, the, the issue management platform to connect it to Archicad is something that, that, that we created for BIM track. Um, and, but also many client specific solutions integrations. Um, sometimes it's depend it's 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 running on on Archicad, sometimes on Revit, sometimes on SketchUp. So we have some development uh, experience with that. And my personal role in the company is also linked more to the the research and the standardization work. So this is um, typically a bit more on the. BIM guidelines, BIM standards, um, also recently been involved in, in, in IFC, in the improvement of the IFC schema. So I think it's very interesting, but it's, it's sometimes a bit farther from the day-to-day -day architectural practice. Hmm. Now, to give you a small example, um, I think one of the, the really strong, strong things in Archicad is of course, the label tool, which in itself is, is very simple. Uh, you can, use a label just to annotate some things. Um, and the labels are, are just, can, can, can easily extract information from the model. Now, what is, what is interesting is that if you start entering your label, you can actually choose what you want to show, even in the, ba in the most basic version of the label tool, um, which is just the text or auto text label. There are more advanced GDL based label tools, which are typically prepared for, for other things, um, which can be a bit more graphical. Um, but in this case, for, for just a basic auto text label, you can, you can insert actually whatever you want. Uh, from the auto text menu, I'm looking now at an object. So I could introduce, um, many of the, maybe the, the classification that, that we're talking about, or one of the properties, or all of these general parameters. Anything that Archicad can schedule, you can also display. A good example is of course the element ID, um, but you can also add other information. Uh, maybe you want to introduce, uh, maybe the, where is the object placed, on which layer, um, or what else? search for it because there are so many things you can show. Maybe the, the layer itself can also be shown. And the interesting thing is of course, once you you work with, with that object or, or you, you develop that object, the data will all, all, always be up to, it will always be up to date. So for instance, if you would enter into the object properties and you change the element ID and you call it a few, bad or something like that, of course, the label follows. And it might seem very simple, but it's, it's in fact something that is, is really strong. Uh, and to give you an example of, of how you can start integrating this into more complex processes is, is, is something that we developed as, as a small plugin, is a small server that we developed running inside Archicad, which actually makes Archicad open to talk to external processes. And for that, um, um, I'm able to call into Archicad from, from a web service, from an external application, the same as you would do in, in a web development system. So what I can do is um, with that system running inside, I can run, let me see if it fits on the screen. I can ask for information and this data is actually extracted and placed into, uh, in this case, all the properties, all the information that is available, I can store it. Um, I can do that for another object, maybe looking at that wall, I can do something similar, request information, and all these things you can start connecting Archicad to maybe an external process, maybe an automation script. Uh, and this is where you also might start sending information back into the system. For instance, once I get a certain object linked to that. And let's try to see if we can 
show it. Um, that name of the object was now shown, it's, it's shown on the screen. But actually, by connecting it, I can update the data from an external system. So I, if I run the script, it sends a message to Archicad and actually changes the object and the label just displays the updated object. This is a very simple example, but it shows that you could even start thinking about Archicad more as, as, as a client server system, as a database of information. And I see that gradually Graphisoft is also expanding the, the functionality of Archicad. And this is where, um, this was something we developed before the Python interface became available. Um, so we have some, uh, we had to use the, the software, the C++ development kit for to do that. Um, but step by step, these things are, are also now, now being um, opened by, by Graphisoft also for with the general um, JSON and Python interfaces. Okay. So and if you start understanding that that you, that that this would really open up the usage of your of, of Archicad, not just as as a as an individual drawing or modeling environment, but also to connect to external systems, and then that is where we where I see BIM being, being more applied in the, in the future. Okay, so let me, let me just um, sketch out a couple of things that I think I understand um, some interesting applications that may not be obvious from your description. So you, you're talking in abstract terms. It can connect to other systems and you can get data and it'll store the data and whatever. So that's all true. <clears throat> What would be a, a one example? So let's say that you have furniture and you're doing some specification for the client um, and you wanted to see what budget would be if we were to go to steel case for these sort of office furniture versus, you know, um, you know some other one or uh, so. We yeah, now that, could, can, could, can we, yeah, that, that's, that would be a good example of, of doing a, a kind of a cost estimation or a quantity takeoff, but not necessarily only within Archicad or within schedules, but it could be run against uh, an external cost database or with an ERP system that uh, maybe a contractor or a larger office is, is using. Um, right. so there so is, imagine, yeah. I'm just going to talk to all of the people watching. Imagine that you put in some generic elements to represent, you know, furniture, equipment, uh, you know, whatever, and then you go and say, you make a decision or somebody makes a decision or you want to test out how it would be if we used this supplier for this type of element so you use a script or you somehow connect it up and you say all right we're going to use this element and okay it has a product code it has maybe a current cost it has some other attributes about weight or you know how much resources it uses if you're talking about carbon or electricity or things like that and it pulls that from the manufacturer or pulls it from a public database and now your ARCAD model may not necessarily look different but you can now get analysis you can now get reports based on some of these choices or schemes now one of the things that's coming up in uh, version 27 and I haven't looked at the details but it's a scheme uh, you know, management. So you can say we have different design schemes. You know, we're going to change the front of the building and add more, you know, fenestration, or we're going to do this or that. Well, it can also be interior fit out or just, you know, different attributes. So now imagine that you can potentially in these different schemes say, well, in this case, we're going to use this type of equipment or furniture. And in this other case, we're going to use a different type. And you know, maybe it even potentially can it. I'll ask you: Can it pull in geometry? Can you actually have a an object that, when you is connected to an outside source, it actually is pulling in the type of chair it is? Um, I would say, on a technical level, yes, it, it, it's all possible. Um, what we covered so far with with the, the connection we made was. Um, the majority was collecting information, extracting it, and then making some basic changes, changing a value, setting a, the name of a room, or setting because the, the this this approach was developed for a few clients um, who want to connect um, want to connect a, a, an ERP system or a bill of materials system 
and be able to extract information straight from Archicad running on the same machine or within the same network, which means you could skip exporting files and importing files. Mm -hmm. And that might seem um, a minor step, but once you, you have to do this numerous times or you want to make changes in the model and get back again, you can you, you don't always have to export or prepare a schedule, export it to an Excel sheet, import that Excel sheet into an external system or export it to IFC and import the IFC. No, you can straight directly go to Archicad, ask some information, pull it straight into your calculation software. And actually the sky is the limit with that. But of yeah. course, you want to ensure that you maintain the, the coherence and the integrity of, of the, the core model. So on, on the safe side, we typically use this in a downstream approach, extracting information, but indeed pushing some, some corrections is, is, is also possible. We, so far, we haven't focused on the geometry itself because we know once you start trying to, to make such changes, you have to be really careful in what you are doing. Yeah. So, for example, if you were to switch out different, just in the simple case, chairs, if the origin point of the chair is not at the lower left corner, it's at the center thing, then all of a sudden, when you switch chairs, they move in space. That that would be, you know, a potential issue. Yeah. Uh, things like for that. that, especially switch switching between library objects needs to have a, a strong, uh, strong coordination on where things are set. But yeah. Now, um, Paul Adams says, I would love to get price updates from the lumber yard that his builder uses for cost estimating. So, yeah. Um, and I'm going to give you all an example to think about. Um, we take for granted nowadays that we don't most of the time need a travel agent to book travel. We can go to the airline's website and figure out what, what flights are available and what their cost is. And we can even see that it's delayed and I don't have to leave for the airport for another hour because my flight actually is. So we're not exporting and importing. We're just querying or asking a question of an online database to say, show me that it flights from New York to Los Angeles today. You know, show me this. So the sky is the limit. You know, I guess is. Uh, yeah, I would have to understand this is this is where we're evolving to. At the same way, you could use your Archicad model, maybe connected to an external uh, estimation service or an external uh, energy or cost calculation system, and maybe even receive the results or maybe a uh, structural calculation system. Mm -hmm. and, and I think Graphisoft is well aware of this because the, the way that we see the evolution of the the interfaces, the Python scripting or the other extensions really pointing to in that direction to to yeah. open it even more than it already is mm -hmm. all right so we are at the, the two hour mark so a good time to finish up any closing words any uh, words of either wisdom or things you want to tell people about or you know get some feedback from people anything um, buy the book <laughs> <laughs> no I, and, and, I think yeah Go ahead, Stefan. Yeah, I would say, of course, we believe that the book is valuable um, and we, we hope that, that many people enjoy it. Um, and to be honest, we have within our, our own minds the whole content for a second book, but of course, <laughs> that, that takes a lot of time. Because mm -hmm. once, once you're at the end of the book, there is so much more you can do. Uh, when we discussed some of the more advanced features, of course, this, this sort of was no room left anymore to cover it all in the book but we still think it's uh, it covers quite a lot of ground but there is so much more you can do and and of course we're we're both open to to to, to get in to get in contact with, with you um, via linkedin or via mail we're really open to feedback or questions or yes. maybe working on a project together who knows okay so um uh, we have um Links here. So, by the way, on uh, this is on the Archicad user website. So, I've got your bio link. So, if I click on that, this is your bio on Amazon, and doesn't look like you have contact information um, here. I would um, suggest that if, if I will check that if there is anything there. Yeah, if Amazon allows it, you should have it, either at yeah. least a website, and if possibly a. Uh, now you can follow, but this may only be 
if you post things on Amazon, you know, uh, yeah. or you, you come out with another book or something like that. Um, anyways, that's um, that's on the Arcad user uh, here. So, and if, if you know, I can, I, I guess I can um, also put a link. You know, I can put the name of your company and the link um, here. Um, so there was one last question that I don't think we have time to really get into, but just a, maybe a couple of comments. Um, this is from Eric Reinhardt. Can you comment on working with life cycle assessment, LCA, tools and calculating embodied carbon? Uh, you may need to use IFC of GBXML to exchange data, or perhaps there's a plug-in. So obviously, Eric Reinhardt is yeah. embodied carbon and green. It's, 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 it's a very important topic. Um, we're actually working in, in a, a, in a research collaboration project right now um, to to work more on that and to see how far we can take the information from different tools including Archicad. IFC is already quite extensive uh, capable of, of transferring that information and Archicad is, is very is capable of exporting that information into IFC to bring into external analy analysis software. Um, um, quite recently they um, added uh, a function in the in the update of Archicad. So there's an LCA uh, evaluation tool in it within Archicad. I haven't been able to test it out yet, but if it's yeah. in the line of their energy evaluation, it, it should be of some use. Yeah. And another tip would be the one-click LCA solution that uses IFC files from any software to do this calculation for you. So that's uh, two softwares I know of uh, that can do oh, this. Uh, based on is it automatic calculation available for this sort of thing? And it's yeah. plug into Archicad or what? Yeah, it's something they added in a recent uh, update for our region, uh, Stefan, but I haven't tested it. I think yet. maybe it's, it's this thing that Kubis could, could could be developed for the, mm -hmm. for the client. But the other I'm one not is... sure if it's globally available. And one, one yeah. click else is an, exter is an independent software. Right. So to reach use. out to Ruben um, uh, here, uh, Ruben or Stefan, um, uh, Eric, just uh, Eric Reinhardt. Um, and uh, they'll at least be able to point you in the right direction or help you directly. So, um, all right, so there's some thank yous here um, and uh, yeah, people saying that uh, very interesting conversation and uh, Stephen Sinclair says dry but important and interesting. So dry, so yes, um, we, <laughs> we need to have some beer. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Anyway, all right. So uh, thank you so much, Stefan, Ruben. Um, thank you for the opportunity. It was really yeah. appreciated. Thanks for having us, Eric. Much appreciated. Thanks for joining Archicad user. If you have any ideas for other topics that you'd like me to cover, other people you'd like me to interview, um, please pass that along to support at bobro.com. Um, you know, each month I try to bring something interesting, whether it's, you know, a developer of Archicad stuff or a user who shares, you know, actual projects um, and, uh, you know, just volunteer or say, hey, look at that guy over there. He's doing some good stuff. And, uh, you know, we'll uh, have more guests and more interesting conversations. So thanks. Take care, Stefan. Ruben, I'll be in touch. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.